So the addition of hydrides is the first real big new reaction in a, in a little while. What we've covered so far in chapter 17 is the part up above here in gray, basically the key points that our electrophiles for this chapter are going to be strong, I mean, excuse me, our electrophiles for this chapter are going to be the carbonyls of aldehydes and ketones, and the nucleophiles are going to be those strong nucleophiles like the hydride ion, which we'll introduce in this mini lecture. The mechanism, really only one, one and a half, okay, one and a half mechanisms in this chapter, because conjugation does throw a curveball into the whole mechanistic realm of things. And then the last key point from the previous mini lecture was that aldehydes are much more reactive than ketones. Now we dive into reductions with a quick review of oxidation state since I covered it in class and just uh, run through the th three basic al um, hydrides we're going to be looking at. So review of oxidation state, let's just go through some examples. Here are four kind of nondescript um, organic molecules. So if I was interested in figuring out and comparing the state to which each of these is oxidized, I have to focus on a specific carbon. So let's look at this carbon, this carbon, this carbon, and this carbon. And note that I'm focusing on the carbon bearing the functional group for each one of these. You could argue that I that the alkene is also a functional group, but I'm going to choose this one. So oxidation state for each of these. Let's just quickly run through them. Carbon, carbon, carbon. Carbons contribute 0, 0, 0, and then chloride would be a minus 1. So the oxidation state for this carbon has to be plus 1. Minus 1, minus 1, but minus 1 twice here. So we've got a total of minus 3 for the carboxylic acid, meaning this carbon has to be plus 3. What about this carbon? Okay, well, nitrogen, like oxygen, is more electronegative than carbon. So we've got nitrogen bonded three times, so we've got a minus three here. So what we're finding out is that this nitrile is, we would say, in the same oxidation state as the carboxylic acid. They are equally oxidized. Then finally, what about this alcohol? Well, beware! the evil line structure strikes again. So I'm not showing that there's a hydrogen attached because I'm using line structure. So you might be tempted to say, okay, 0, 0, minus 1, so this is clearly plus 1. And of course you'd be wrong because there is a hydrogen attached. I'm just not showing it. So what do we have? We have 0, 0, minus 1, plus 1. So the overall oxidation state of that carbon is 0. So beware once again of the evils of line structure. Now, so we know that this guy is oxidation state 0. What I'm particularly interested in when teaching you oxidation states is using oxidation states to help you understand what kind of reagents will affect a transformation. So for example, if I was looking at the relationship between this ketone and this alcohol, clearly the difference between the two is that I have ripped off the hydrogen attached to this carbon to make this ketone. So this is a loss of one hydrogen we decided this oxidation state was 0. We know that this one is plus 2 because the oxygen is minus 2. So losing one hydrogen, I have oxidized. Going from the alcohol to the ketone is an oxidation, and I will need an oxida oxidation agent or an oxidizing agent or an oxidant to go from here to here. Well, we'll get to that later. 
But in this chapter, we're going to look at the fact that, hey, it looks like to go from here to the alcohol, I am adding a hydrogen that is a nucleophile. I know the ketone is an electrophile. I'm adding a hydrogen. Therefore, I need to add something that looks like H minus. And that's exactly what this first mini lecture, first part of the chapter is about, the hydride reducing agents. All right, so hydrides, we put little quotes around them, call them H minus, because mm, not all hydrides are the same. We're going to look at th basically four hydrides, two that are quite similar. NADH, which is a biochemical version of a hydride, and then sodium hydride. So you learn Gen Chem for a reason, and that is because you are going to apply it again and again, this time in terms of Lewis structures and ionic and covalent bonds. So when you see lithium aluminum hydride or sodium borohydride, what you want to do is what well, you've been doing all along cross out the spectator ion and what do you have? You have a complex anion. The aluminum hydride or the um, uh, borohydride anion. Okay, so what? Well if you know these um, separate st structures for these separate anions then you can apply what you learned earlier this semester, or last semester in 2301. You can use Vesper to draw out the tetrahedral three-dimensional structure and realize that, hmm, going back to Gen Chem, we're looking at a part of the periodic table that is in group three. Okay, so here's an aluminum, or you'll see it's the same thing for boron that has four, hydri four hydrogens around it and a negative charge. Well, you know, boron and aluminum, they don't really necessarily want to be tetravalent. Being in group three means that they should have three bonds around them to be neutral. But here they are with four bonds around them. What in effect this is telling you is that Aluminum hydride picks up hydrogen with another pair of electrons because, uh -huh, yeah, we've learned all this stuff. Oh, you're getting tired of me saying, remember this stuff that we learned before? It would be sp2 hybridized with an empty p orbital that could react with a hydrogen that has an extra pair of electrons and is therefore negative to give you a new bond from the orbital overlap between the hydride anion and the empty p orbital on aluminum to give you that guy right there. But it's kind of a schizophrenic structure because over here it's negatively charged, over here it's neutral, so you can imagine, I hope, that these species, the borohydride species and the tetrahydroaluminate species, they wouldn't mind losing H minus. And that's the whole point of this, that lithium, lithium aluminum hydride and sodium borohydride are really ready and willing to give up H minus to something that is willing to accept it. Obviously H minus is a nucleophile, so these are good hydride donors to a particular electrophile, and naturally the electrophile we're looking at in this chapter is aldehydes and ketones. So here's a nice looking electrophile. We're going to add sodium borohydride to it. Sodium borohydride is typically used in an alcoholic solvent. It's a pretty reactive reagent. Doesn't take much 
nice low temperature, put it in an ice bath for one hour, and what do you get? Well, the nice thing is we can kind of ignore all of that detail from the previous slide and realize that I've got a nucleophile and I've got an electrophile and use your electron movement arrows to make the new hydrogen carbon bond. That gives me this intermediate and that intermediate can then pick up a hydrogen from my alcohol to give that product. Alright, so a couple things to point out. I ignored the rest of the molecule. The rest of the molecule is of no interest to me. I see that there's a rest of a molecule and I look at the rest of the molecule and I realize that this is my nucleophile this is my electrophile. So you have to focus on the electrophile. The other point I want to make is the usual one, beating a dead horse. I hate line structure. I love line structure. It's so easy to draw, but you don't see what's happening. So here's the obvious thing that's happening. One hydrogen added, one hydrogen from the aldehyde. Couple of important questions to point out. Um, why doesn't the hydride react with ethanol? Well, before we answer that question, I should really deal with the red arrows that popped up on the screen that I put there for a reason. And the reason I put those red arrows up there is because I wanted to point out the change in oxidation state. So what do we got? We got minus one, minus two, plus one, and zero. So we got a minus two, a plus one, and a zero. So this had better be oxidation state plus one. Put those hydrogens back in here to figure out this oxidation state. Plus one, plus one, minus one, minus one. So we've clearly affected a reduction. And that's a reducing agent. But back to the other question, why doesn't hydride react with um, the alcohol? Well, it does actually, but rather slowly. And that's why we're using a uh, lower temperature to keep the sodium borohydride from reacting extensively with the alcohol. But it's important to realize that not all hydrides can be run in an alcohol solvent. So lithium aluminum hydride is what I like to call the elephant gun of hydride reagents. And I will get, give some more detail about that in a moment. But if you're going to run a reaction to reduce a carbonyl using lithium aluminum hydride, you absolutely, positively, must write your reaction as one, add lithium aluminum hydride, and then when that's finished reacting, two, work it up using water or a mildly acidic workup. So this is an important recipe for those of you who work in the lab. You must add H3O or your protic solvent workup separately from the lithium aluminum hydride. If I throw these in together at the same time, these two will just react with one another to make well, let's see what this acid base chemistry will do. We will get lots and lots of H2 and we'll get heat and we'll get lithium hydroxide. And we'll get aluminum salts as well. So lithium aluminum hydride cannot be done in the presence of an alcoholic solvent or a protic solvent like water. Sodium borohydride, it's, it's mild enough that you can carry out the reaction in alcohol. So why? Well, it goes back to the periodic table and the fact that 
boron being one uh, one row above aluminum, a lot smaller. It's a lot closer in size to hydrogen. That in conjunction with the electronegativity difference between aluminum hydrogen and boron hydrogen means that gee whiz, any aluminum hydrogen bond is a lot more likely to cleave than a boron, boron hydrogen bond. So, um, the elephant gun is basically that lithium aluminum hydride can be darn dangerous to work with, as my friend Sven figured out in graduate school. And I want to keep this short, so if you want to hear the story about Sven, who is a real person, don't let anybody else tell you otherwise, remind me to tell you in class the story of Sven. Okay, the NA, NADH stuff is in a special set-off box in your chapter, but it's very cool stuff, so I want you to be aware of it. NADH is Mother Nature, or Biochemistry's, answer to lithium aluminum hydride, and this is the structure of NADH. The good news is, you know, bio, biochemicals have all this extra spaghetti. The good news is, in OCHEM, we just abbreviate all that extra spaghetti as R because this is the working part of the molecule and these are specifically the working pieces. So when my NADH encounters something to be reduced somewhere in an organism, in an enzyme pocket for example, like this aldehyde, what can and will happen is that the lone pair on this nitrogen plops, well, it's kind of in the wrong place here, but plops in and knocks that pair of pi electrons over and kicks out the hydride, reducing the carbonyl. Now you've got to keep in mind that this is biochemistry, not beaker chemistry, and in biochemistry we, we get away with murder, basically. So somewhere in that enzyme pocket, the, there is going to be a proton donor so that what happens all at once, you know this is very unreasonable in a beaker. There's no way that all these molecules are going to come together in a beaker. But in an enzyme pocket, everybody's coordinated and held, held in close proximity. So NADH pops in. The lone pair kicks out the hydride, reduces the aldehyde to give you NAD plus and the reduced um, aldehyde, the alcohol. Two things to point out. One, the driving force for NADH, of course, is that I've now made an aromatic molecule. But it's also important to notice that in a biochemical system, this will be a stereospecific reduction. So I will get either the R or the S, but I will not get both stereoisomers in this reduction. All right, the last hydride we're going to look at is sodium hydride, which is kind of an oddball. It's very much counterintuitive. It looks like a hydride. We've been talking about hydrides. It should reduce just like everything else, but it does not. It does not add to carbonyls to reduce them. It is strictly a base. So if I'm going to look at a ketone, I've got to go back and think about the fact that, eeks, actually, all, t all the while, these aldehydes and ketones, I c we can't forget that they're electrophilic at the alpha carbon. These hydrogens are removable by base to make enolates. So that's kind of something we've been ignoring. So they're electrophilic at the alpha carbon, because we can deprotonate at the alpha carbon, and of course they're electrophilic at the carbonyl carbon. So, <sighs> why is it that when I add lithium aluminum hydride, I get attack at this electrophilic atom, but with sodium hydride, I get strictly acid-base chemistry. Oh fudge. Removal of the alpha, the, beta, the 
hydrogen on the alpha carbon to give you the enolate, which is delocalized as shown here. Well, you know, sometimes we present things a little bit more simply than we should. Sodium is just a boring old uh, small, hard, nondescript counterion. But, as is lithium. But when we look at aluminum in particular, or um, boron, these guys are actually easily something that coordinates to oxygen. So you have to keep in mind that the aluminum or boron from the lithium aluminum hydride or the sodium borohydride actually coordinate to the oxygen and in so doing they essentially tell that hydrogen you're going here and nowhere else. It's called a directed hydrogen transfer. Sodium hydride on the other hand is really more of a free hydride. It's off and running. It can go wherever it wants to and therefore it's not tethered to the oxygen it's able to just come over here. Well, actually, not there. It's going to come over here and rip off the hydrogen to make the enolate. So keep in mind that all hydrides aren't the same, and that while some lithium aluminum hydride and sodium borohydride reduce. Sodium hydride is strictly a proton transfer kind of guy. All right, so to summarize all this, lithium aluminum hydride, your basic elephant gun that is kind of dangerous to use and must have a separate workup step. Lithium, uh, sodium borohydride does the exact same chemistry, reduces the carbonyl, but it doesn't require a separate workup step. NADH is the biochemical version of these reagents, and that sodium hydride is confusing, but that it is just a base, and these are all reducing agents. Next up, reductions with organometallics. So stay tuned.